Kentucky volunteer, executive council member, it is my privilege to represent Lexington and those in the 6th Congressional District. We are always delighted to have time to share with our AARP members and those who have not yet joined, our Lexington community leaders and special guests tonight. Thank you for joining us for this important educational webinar on housing choices for everyone at every age or ability in Fayette County. AARP is here to help you take on today and every day. From sharing practical resources to holding fun activities and local events and community partnerships, AARP is providing opportunities to connect and help build an even stronger Kentucky and Lexington for all ages to live, work, and play. Again, thank you for joining us tonight, and please send us any feedback or questions. You can send email to kyaarp at aarp.org or find AARP Kentucky on Facebook. Now it is my pleasure. Please allow me to introduce you to our facilitator tonight my friend and fellow volunteer team meeting member, Margaret McCoskey. Margaret is a retired social worker, full-time caregiver, and longtime resident of Fayette County. It is my pleasure and honor, Margaret dear, I hand it over to you. Thank you, Mary Lynn, I appreciate those kind words. Yes, I have been a caregiver, I am a AARP proud volunteer. And I welcome everyone. I hope this will be beneficial. The ABCs of Accessory Dwelling Units 101. Before we get started, I wanted to touch base with you all about the issue of questions. We encourage you to write down any questions you may have as we go through our presentation this evening. We do have a pretty full agenda for you. And if time allows, we will try to address your questions either through the host chat function or submit a, a, a question through the Q&A and we will get to them if possible. I do wanna let you know that coming June 10th, will be another webinar at 6.30 PM. And this will be the ABCs of ADUs 102. And then we'll have a little bit more time for questions. So do, as you hear the presenters this evening, mark down your questions. And if not time today to address them, keep them for June 10th. So to get started, what is an ADU? I've heard this term around for some time, but just exactly what is an ADU? Well, it stands for Accessory Dwelling Unit. ADUs are fully contained dwellings or home designed with their own kitchens, bath, bedroom, and a living area on the same lot as the main home. Hence, they are accessory to the main house on a single family residential lot. Now, there can be various forms of that ADU. There can be a detached ADU. So a detached, as the graph shows here, is a standalone structure. The upper left-hand corner, that's a detached. It's a separate structure on the same lot as the main structure. Then there could be an attached, the upper one in the middle. It connects to the main house. Usually an attached is on a side, as this shows, or at the back of the main house. There can be a garage. That's the lower middle, it looks like. 
use of attached or detached garage area converted that space into a living or an ADU space for someone. Then there's internal, where you convert a portion of the main house to become a separate residence. For instance, it could be a basement area, or it might be an attic area, which is contained within the main house, but you convert it to a living space. So as the, as the graph shows here, you can see an overall, get a, get a picture in your mind of what we mean when we say attached, detached garage interior. So keep that in mind as we go through this evening. So I want to, I think we have another slide maybe, do we? Thank you. <laughs> um, I just wanted to reiterate that uh, you will be seeing some of the AARP um, notices about our ADUs in our city. And as we go through this process, just remember that ADUs can help parents. They can help we as adult children live out our lives with dignity and uh, keep an eye on them and have family, multi-generational aspects of family together. So the more we do these kinds of presentations, the more you all learn the, and educate yourselves, I think we will learn pretty quickly why these are very valuable for our community. So I hope that helps to define a little bit. Now I'm going to turn it over to Brent Sturlogson. Brent is assistant professor at the University of Kentucky's College of Design. And he and his students entered a contest a year, or maybe it was more ago now, um, with some designs that could be used locally for ADUs. Brent, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Margaret. So this is a really, I think, fascinating topic for me. It's a longstanding interest. I just did the math a few minutes ago and realized it was 15 years ago that I designed my first ADU as an architecture student myself. And um, it was just in, in 2018 that, that then the process unfolded with some of my own students. So um, it's, been a, it's been a long and um, consistent effort for me. And I, I gained just a lot of value in, in thinking about it professionally and with my students. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly today about some of the design goals that we had for this competition, this design competition that we staged, um, give a bit of historical context to this notion of accessory dwelling units. As a professor and, and architect, I'm, I'm always looking for examples of, of how this has been done before. Um, and we'll, we'll see two examples of that in, in Lexington. Um, and then just a summary of the process that we developed to solicit these ideas from both students and local professionals for what uh, an ADU or a proposed zoning ordinance amendment would do or would look like in Lexington. Um, so first of all, the, the, the two main goals that we had going into this, this design work um, was one, to preserve the existing character of the city, right? So on, on the left, we just see an aerial image of Lexington. Our, our first ambition was not to fundamentally change this. Um, the second goal builds on that. And the second goal was to accommodate a wider range of users. So on the right, we can see um, maybe a typical house in, in many neighborhoods in Lexington um, that already we can identify obstacles to different users, right? The stairs leading up to the first floor, the stairs leading up to the second floor already make this house um, unusable for some, right? Um, and, and what could we do as designers, as students, as architects to widen the range of users um, without having to say, extend the boundary of the city or change the character um, of the existing um, built environment? So I think as Margaret already outlined in, in the diagram on the slide, uh, there's many ways this house on the right can be adapted, right? There could be a, a separate unit attached onto the back with, with more accessibility concerns in mind. Um, there could be a detached unit set back in the backyard 
Um, but in any case, a, a lot of these are, are barely visible, if visible at all, right? And, and so the existing streetscape would largely remain unchanged, right? Thereby accommodating both goals, right? To keep the existing character of the city um, and then to widen the range of, of users that can, that can be accommodated uh, in this. So, so now for the very brief history lesson, I love this stuff and I could go on for quite a while about it. Um, but I did a little bit of digging to see kind of where this might have, have come up, right? This idea of accessory dwelling units, right? It's just a, a secondary or a, uh, an additional unit on, on the lot. Um, and there's this fascinating, call it an early memoir from, from an from a industrialist in Lexington from the 1810s. His name was Samuel D. McCullough. Um, and here in a, in a reproduction of, of what, what he called my early reminiscences, reminiscences of Lexington, Kentucky, um, he talks about all kinds of, you know, his life's work and, and his, his successes. But he also re refers to one of his childhood friends living in the carriage house in the back of the lot. So in this, in this textual description from deep in the archive, almost 200 or more than 200 years ago now, uh, we see evidence of this, 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 call it an accessory dwelling unit. He called it a carriage house, um, but it's, it's present nonetheless. Um, and then on the two images on the right show uh, an aerial rendering from the 1870s. So 60 years later of early Lexington as it was growing. Um, almost 100 years um, in, in maturity at that point. And we zoom in, we can look at these lots and see all kinds of accessory dwelling units happening um, behind the main house, right? Away from the, the main street. Um, and we don't know exactly what these were, but the character of the city was growing to include some of these um, accessory dwelling units or carriage houses or, or any number of names that they're, they're referred to um, today. Um, so I was really excited when in 2018, after this, this, this amazing planning process uh, materialized in the Imagine Lexington plan, to see that among their policies for improving equity in the city um, was to provide this wider range of uses for, for senior housing, especially through accessory dwelling units. We took this um, with a, a, a great number of partners to uh, see what the students in the College of Design at the University of Kentucky could imagine. And we extended it also to professors, working architects in Lexington and beyond. We, we, we sent the call out um, to a national network of designers, um, both students and prof professionals, to see, again, what we could generate. Here we're seeing a couple images from uh, the exhibition where um, Mayor Linda Gorton came by. Um, Dean Mitzi Vernon on the right in the center image, um, congratulating the students um, and having a, a, a celebration of all of this work that went into it. And here, um, the images are, are deliberately very small. We're not gonna get into any of the details of the designs themselves, uh, but just a sample of, of a few of the ideas that came from um, both students, but then also working architects in, in Lexington uh, and around. So these ideas generated a lot of interest. They generated a lot of debate, a lot of discussion on, on how this, this, this zoning amendment might be achieved. Um, and the planning department, as I think Chris will explain to us a little bit later, um, developed this really accessible and user-friendly guide to accessory dwelling units that then um, we were you know, kind of shopping around, right, in these public meetings, publicizing with AARP, um, again, to generate um, discussion, right? A lot of this is to instigate um, communication among, among neighbors and among residents. Um, on, the on the left is an image of one of the student projects that we featured in a physical model, um, and then a screenshot from some local news coverage. I'm, when I show this image, um, I, I have to, I have to show how proud I am of this student. He's, cur he's currently finishing his first year at Harvard Graduate School. So he's done, he's done very well since his time at, at Lexington. Um, and we've really enjoyed um, sharing the model that, that he was able to build. Um, and the last thing I'll, I'll close here to keep it brief um, on this idea of debate and discussion. I think it's really healthy when we're considering changing policy in our cities and in our urban environment to have these discussions. It's, it's critically important that we can 
um, each kind of speak our minds and say our piece and, and then have that discussion. So um, I'm, I'm very curious to hear from the others on the panel tonight, but um, almost more curious to hear about the, the, some reactions from the attendees um, in order to keep this discussion going, right? That we can generate more questions, more proposed topics for debate um, in, in the spirit of, of shared growth. Um, so that's, that's, that's where I'll end it tonight. Um, and I'll, I'll look forward to any questions and um, discussion that we'll have after the presentation. So thank you very much. I think you're on mute, Margaret. You do need to hear me, apologize. Thank you, Brandt. We do look forward to your continued work with us on this um, and your students as well. It was a really wonderful exhibition and contest that you all put on. So thanks again. Now I wanna introduce a group of three very talented individual women. They're going to talk about age-friendly Lexington and reimagine home. On the panel, we have Mary Crowley Schmidt with the Area Agency on Aging, Christy Stambaugh, the Director of Aging and Disability Services with the Lexington uh, City. And we have Gail Reitz, who wears many hats. Gail is the founder of ITN Transportation Network, the I Know Expo, and Reimagine Home. She is also a past chair of the um, Senior Services Commission and currently serves as a commission member. So ladies, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Margaret. Um, if you don't mind, Christy and, and uh, Mary, I'll jump in. Uh, and tell you a little bit. Number one, Margaret, I don't think, I can't imagine all of that has happened in my life in 15 years. <laughs> That's as long as I have been uh, working in, on senior issues. And boy, have I learned a lot from the professionals that are also, from Mary, from Margaret, from from uh, Christy, from everyone who's in aging in Lexington. We are so fortunate to have these people to help us uh, kind of wade through the issues of aging. So when I started looking into aging, I wasn't a senior, but now I am. So I understand in ways that uh, I never did before exactly what these issues are. Let me give you a little history so um, Age-Friendly Lexington is a worldwide effort to make cities more friendly to our aging populations and all citizens. And as Mary said, whether in one of our first commission members meetings, whether they are on a walker, a wheelchair, pushing a baby carriage or riding a tricycle and a bicycle, so Lexington was one of the very first cities in the country to join the AARP effort. Uh, then we had during uh, 2012 and 13, we had a lot of numerous community discussions. Mary or uh, Christy, would you like to share a little bit about those? You all headed those. Go ahead, Christy. Okay, so um, we did community conversations. They were called Ask Lexington, and it gave persons an opportunity to answer five simple questions. And basically they were about quality of life and how do you want to live and what kind of community do you want to live in? And more importantly, what would you change about the community you live in currently? And so I think if I remember correctly, it was a really long time ago, but I think we had more than 385 participants in 25 different groups, including conversations that happened at the Correctional Institute and also with some teen or pregnant moms in one of the schools here in Lexington. So we had a variety of neighborhoods that got involved and engaged. Um, it was a really 
fun project. Then Mary and I went to a conference and learned about this age-friendly Lexington and said, you know what? Everything that we do is meant to create better quality of life for our city. So how can we get more organized and more engaged? And so Mary, do you wanna talk about that real quick? Sure, so we, we um, met with the AARP and kind of got an outline of how this happens to join their network of age-friendly communities. And the first step was to get the mayor on board. And that wasn't a hard sell. He has always been very supportive, he and now she, um, because we've gone through a couple different administrations. The executive council, we needed to form an executive council. And fortunately, we already had the Senior Services Commission, which is a group of individuals from all walks of life that are, um, part of the groups of commissions that the city has. So that became the, uh, the kind of lead group. And we started, we looked, the first thing we did was look at everything Lexington is already doing. And we're doing a lot. There was a lot of things that were already in place that were very positive, but through our many conversations that we had community meetings and at every one we had at least 40 people, we learned that there's a lot of other things we can do to make Lexington a more age-friendly community. So we, uh, one of the big things that came up from all these conversations and there were eight domains, one of the big things was housing. How and where are we going to live? Uh, I can tell you from uh, first hand information, things that as a homeowner, so my husband and I had a nice big family home with a big yard and flower beds and, and lots of space for all of our grandchildren. And, but I can tell you that what was pleasant or at least an uneventful task at that stage of life as a young and middle-aged homeowner, you know, it became a barrier to an otherwise comfortable home. So we decided about a year or so, year or so ago to look for something different. But the last three or four years, a group of people have been getting together and we started talking about how are we gonna live in the future. So we, uh, we call ourselves Home Reimagined and we looked at all different types of living uh, arrangements around the country. We looked at shared housing, people are doing that. We looked at a, a project called The Villages and that's where you co-opt uh, services and stay in your own home. We looked at how you need to adapt your home so that you can stay in your home. And then we looked at the alternatives, like the uh, residential places and where, where would we or could we go? It became evident uh, as time went on that uh, everyone has different uh, needs but there was something that kept popping up called accessory dwelling units. We call them different things. You know, you have heard carriage house was one thing in the 1800s. That was fascinating, Brent, with the, the map and all of that. Sometimes you call them granny flats in England. Uh, you can call them, uh, some people have a garage apartments or, or whatever. But we realized that this was an option that is important to Lexington because we have to use our acreage very carefully. Lexington's like an island. We're not surrounded by water, but we're surrounded by beautiful horse farms and beautiful farmland. And we need to uh, maintain that. And we want to be close to family and caregivers. So, for my husband and I, we chose, uh, unfortunately, we chose to sell and move and buy during the pandemic, but everything worked out okay. It was a little touchy there for a while, but we moved into a town home that has a second floor. If sometime in the future, and it has a spacious second floor, if sometime in the future we need help, it's entirely possible to make an apartment up here. And if it had a kitchen, 
then it would be even more attractive for a future caregiver or for a family member to move in or maybe another family. So we're kind of looking at the next stage in our life and seeing where and how we can live in this last uh, home that we hope to have. There is something else that has popped up though, thinking about the pandemic, many of you may know that, um, and Mary, I'm gonna let you talk about the pandemic and how it's affected housing, especially our residential facilities. Okay. Um, you would have had to have been living under a rock not to see what's happened with our long-term care facilities during the pandemic. They've been kind of a petri dish for the virus and, um, you know, just untold numbers of people becoming ill and, um, and passing away in these facilities. And it's not because the facilities were doing a, a poor job. It's just the nature of the way they're set up. People, you know, aides going from room to room and, um, you know, the close quarters that they, they live in. So um, because of what was happening there and then staffing shortages, which is, you know, a universal issue. I mean, it's not just in-home services and long-term care. You know, our nation is really facing a, a crisis of the workforce. So um, it, it became apparent that bringing people home, we got calls at our office and we take, you know, up to 2000 calls a month related to aging services at the Air Agency on Aging of people saying, I, I wanna bring mom home. Are there, can I do that? Are there services? Is there help to help me build a place for her? So, um, you know, the we've, we've been, wanting to move away from institutionalization for a long time. And this has kind of brought the need to the forefront that there needs to be more options rather than just the institutional care. Um, and, and in the case, if you had a family member that contracted COVID and they had to go stay somewhere else or try to confine themselves to a bedroom, if you'd had, had a separate, separate living space, they could have, um, you know, sheltered there and not infected the rest of the family. So it was, you know, it, there were not many good things about COVID, but if, if nothing else, it raised our awareness of the need to rethink the way we provide long-term care to our elders. Christy, is there anything from your experience at the Senior Center and the input that you've had that uh, kind of reiterates what Mary's been saying? No, I think when we hear from Kim later today in this um, webinar that she's gonna really be able to share a really um, interesting story and her experience during COVID and trying to find housing for her mom. So I would like to just say that uh, we need to help, as a city, make it more feasible for families to help family and for caregivers to be convenient in neighborhoods. So thank you all for listening and we look forward to your comments and your chats and your questions. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. We appreciate your input and your hard work we're going to turn now to the LFUCG planning. Chris Woodall is with us this evening. He is the manager of long range planning for the city. Chris. Thank you, Margaret. I'm gonna share my screen here in just a second. All right, if you all can see that. So as Margaret said, my name is Chris Woodall. I'm the manager of long range planning for the city of Lexington. And uh, what that means is that we're looking kind of far out into the future about how we continue to grow and develop in the city of Lexington. Um, Lexington is actually a very exciting and vibrant city to work in city planning uh, because we are such a, an exciting uh, city for, for, for a number of reasons, but we are continuing to grow. And as we do that, we need to plan for that future. 
And what our job is to do at the uh, Division of Planning and Long Range Planning is to set up what's called the Comprehensive Plan. And that sets um, our, it's a guiding document for the next 20 years of our growth and development. Um, so, you know, there's, with us being a growing city, there's a lot of opportunities uh, that come along with that and a lot of excitement, but there's also a lot of challenges that come along with it too. And so through our study to get to our comprehensive plan, we, we found a couple of the things. And one of those challenges is that we are continuing to grow. And right now we've got over 320,000 people. Um, but by the year 2035, we're projected to have almost 400,000 people. So I know all of you out there are pretty good at math, but that means that we're gonna be at a, about 80,000 more people in the next 20 years. So from our side of things, we're trying to figure out, okay, what does that mean? What does that growth look like for the city of Lexington? And as you can imagine, with 80,000 people coming, that means they also have to have somewhere to live. Uh, and a housing study that we, um, that we engaged in, um, in in preparation for our comprehensive plan told us that we have about 2,300 additional housing units needed every single year. Um, and that would take us back to production levels that are sort of pre-recession production levels of, of producing housing. Uh, and, and so we, we've got a lot of challenges there and we've got to figure out some creative ways to solve that uh, housing problem. So another interesting and unique thing about uh, Lexington is that we have uh, a unique land use control feature or growth management feature that's called an urban service boundary. Uh, it was actually the first of its kind in the United States back in 1958. And as you can see, it's sort of taken on various shapes and forms over the years, sometimes expanding, sometimes contracting. Uh, but the last major expansion of the urban service boundary was over 20 years ago. Uh, and the most recent comprehensive plan has, has committed to retaining that boundary. So, um, you know, the reason we have that is to make sure that we retain a fiscally responsible growth pattern for the city so that our growth doesn't outstrip our ability to pay for that growth. Um, and that added growth restraint uh, or constraint is great for curbing suburban sprawl and making sure that we retain our world class horse farms, but it also does require us to get creative with our housing solutions. So as Brent mentioned, the 2018 comprehensive plan called Imagine Lexington uh, put forward a, a, a potential solution for uh, a small piece of that housing puzzle uh, in, in the form of accessory dwelling units. Now, this is not, you know, while, while we're calling it a creative housing solution, I think you can see from what Brent presented that this is really not a new housing option at all, uh, but something that's been around for a long time. And we're simply talking about how we can uh, bring that back as a part of our housing strategy. Uh, the problem with us bringing this forward as a housing solution is that currently it's not a legal housing option, uh, which means that the city of planning, uh, the city's division of planning would have to put forward some regulatory uh, reform and some change in order to permit that type of housing. So at the same time, kind of going back to the home reimagined initiative that they talked about earlier, uh, you know, accessory dwellings are not the only type of housing uh, strategy that can be employed. But again, it's a small piece of a much larger puzzle um, for, for those who are advancing in age, but certainly for everyone in the community as well. And I'll kind of talk about some of those benefits here in just a minute. But we were very fortunate to uh, be able to partner up with several other organizations who are pursuing the same types of housing goals that we were, uh, including the Senior Services Commission, which you heard some uh, of the members earlier talking about that. Uh, they're wonderful advocates for this, and, and we wouldn't have been able to get this far in the discussion without them. Uh, and then uh, Brent with the uh, University of Kentucky College of Design also uh, provided a, a unique perspective and, and some, um, some fresh ideas to that discussion as well. And then we were fortunate to partner with AARP uh, to talk to uh, create that ADU um, design manual um, and uh, they provided some grant funds for us to be able to, to take that on. 
So um, we all partnered in this important housing solution because it does provide a number of benefits for our community. So one of those is that they provide very flexible options for people who want to age in place. And we've, we've heard from people that, um, that they would prefer, the vast majority of people as they age prefer to stay in their home um, and prefer to stay in their neighborhood as well. So how can we provide options for them to do that? Uh, one of them is, is through ADUs and whether people want to rent out uh, the primary unit or the ADU to provide some supplemental income to be able to continue to afford uh, to live in their home as they might be in a fixed income. Uh, it's, it's important and, and as people look to downsize, um, as Gail was talking about too, you maybe you want to turn uh, part of the house, maybe you don't need all that space anymore and maybe it could be more useful for something else, but you like your neighborhood, you like where you live, you like your neighbors. Uh, so, so that's just one benefit that it provides. Uh, it also enables families to stay together. So where there's opportunities within a house for flexibility, um, you know, it's, it's important, but it also allows for autonomy. So there are some housing solutions where, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you could live within the same house, but maybe you, you want to still have that level of autonomy and, uh, and you don't need to be within the same dwelling. Uh, ADUs allow people to have that separate living space and uh, engage in multi-generational living, uh, whether that's someone that's older or maybe it's a, a college student who has just returned and is looking for the next stage of life. Uh, it allows for that multi-generational uh, family uh, dynamic to, uh, to flourish. And then also it allows for caregiver assistance. So uh, again, it allows for caregivers to be nearby. Again, those who want that autonomy still, um, but need for caregivers to be close by. This is an excellent option for those and they would greatly uh, benefit from that. And then two, it provides that incremental density. So Brent showed you that uh, photo of a house in Lexington. Um, and just by looking at that, you wouldn't be able to tell whether there was two dwelling units there or just one, whether there's a primary residence and an ADU, or if it's just one house. So really it provides some unnoticeable density that retains the built form of the existing neighborhood, which is really important. Um, additionally, you know, we in, in the planning world like to talk about walkable neighborhoods and, and providing additional um, customers for neighborhood businesses. Uh, and providing that density allows for, for some of those things uh, to be successful too. And then it allows for continued investment in the home, uh, which is always a good thing and, and allows for some, again, some additional uh, flexibility. And, and that seems to be kind of the word that sticks in my mind uh, for accessory dwelling units is flexibility, because you never know what your family circumstance is going to throw at you. And so it's incredibly important for your housing salute, for your housing to be flexible uh, and allow for any of these uh, variety of options. So again, this is an incredibly versatile housing type that provides a number of benefits to the individuals, but also to the community as well. Uh, and it's meeting several of Lexington's long-term growth goals. Uh, so in, in kind of in closing, um, we told you that, that currently this is not a uh, legal housing option, uh, but we are pursuing uh, some um, legislation that would uh, allow accessory dwelling units um, to be legal. And currently that is in our Urban County Council Planning and Public Safety Committee, and it's awaiting further action. So for those of you who are interested in, in any of the boring planner stuff that I talked about at the beginning or interested in accessory dwelling units, um, I would encourage you to go to uh, imaginelexington.com and you can find out a little bit about the history of the accessory dwelling units uh, regulations that we put forward. Or if you wanna zoom out even further, the big picture about how that fits into the growth of Lexington over the next 20 years. So, uh, Margaret, with, with that, I'll conclude and uh, kick it back over to you. Thank you, Chris. That was very, very informative. We're going to switch gears now and talk to an individual who is a caregiver at present time herself. She's also at the same time a mother 
and works full time and is a doctoral student in gerontology at the University of Kentucky. She has quite a story to tell. So with that, I wanna introduce you to Kim Browning. Thank you, Margaret. Um, and as Margaret said, my name is Kim Browning. Uh, I'm a mother, a daughter, a full-time employee, and a part-time student. I'm going to share with you my mother's housing relocation story, which happened last year, um, right, right when the pandemic got started. On April 23rd, 2020, my mother's oldest sister called me and told me I needed to plan to move my mother to Kentucky. At that time, my mother was living in Pennsylvania with her significant other, and she was uh, quite close to three of her three sisters. Um, at that time, I had two sons at home, one in high school, one in college, both learning remotely, and I'm my mother's only child. I suggested to my aunt that I really wasn't prepared, um, but she didn't want to hear that. So I began looking into possible places for my mom to live. I honestly didn't think it was practical for her to live in my house with my sons, our, our new puppy, our, our pandemic puppy, uh, and our two cats. An ADU could have been the answer I was looking for at this point, providing my mom some of the privacy she still wanted, some of the help that she, she needed, um, and she would have been close enough that, she, that we could have included her in daily activities. Oh, I think I, I neglected to mention that my mom had been diagnosed with an um, undefined form of dementia in late 2019, and that was the primary reason for her to be relocating. After some time looking, um, I really didn't come up with a, a good solution, so I decided to move my mom temporarily into my house. And determine proper placement then. My youngest son, who was uh, in high school and still is, uh, he was not very happy about this. Um, and again, if an ADU had been a possibility, it may have been a lifesaver for us at that point. All of my mother's belongings arrived in early September, and then my mom arrived on September 13th. My college-age son, fortunately, had gone back to college as his room was completely filled with my mother's possessions, many of which she would never need again. Um, I quickly realized that my mom's mental status had changed since we had last seen her um, at Christmas time in 2019. And there were many things that we hadn't been told. And the weeks that my mom was in my house were really harder than they needed to be. I work full time, as Margaret mentioned, I'm I'm going to school for my PhD in gerontology, and I have one child still at home. All of the bedrooms and the full bathrooms at my house are upstairs. And the entire time that my mom was at my house, I worried constantly about her falling down the stairs. We met with the director of a local assisted living community, and she assessed my mom and determined that she was appropriate for assisted living at that time. She knew my mother was living with dementia. I moved my mother into assisted living on a Friday in late October 2020. Unbeknownst to me, my mother walked out of that assisted living on Saturday evening, and no one made sure that she came back in. The Lexington Fire Department called me late Saturday, early Sunday, about midnight, maybe one o'clock, and waking me up from a sound sleep. And they said, we have your mother. She's been knocking on doors. I was confused and said, do you mean she's been knocking on doors in her assisted living community? No, ma'am, they said, uh, she's in a neighborhood. And my heart still falls when I say that. They estimated that my mother was two miles from the assisted living community where she was living. At five o'clock that morning, the director of the assisted living community called me and told me I had to move my mother that day. It was a Sunday. I reminded her that it was a Sunday and that the bed that my mother had been sleeping on in my house was now at her assisted living community. I could not move my mother that day. 
I had to hire a sitter to stay with my mom until I could move her. Again, if an ADU had been a possibility, we may have been able to prevent this whole traumatic episode. Fortunately, my, my mother was not hurt, but you can imagine she, she walked for about six hours um, and anything could have happened. Um, I'm, thank, you know, I, I'm thankful to someone I'll never know who saw my mother on their front yard and decided to go talk to her and called 911. So with the help of people I know, I was able to move my mom into a memory care community on Tuesday. Soon after they went complete lockdown because of COVID. So no visits at all. My mom living with dementia knew no one at this community before the day she moved in there. And now I couldn't visit her either. The memory care community costs $6,400 per month. In January, I learned that they were giving my mom an antidepressant and an antipsychotic not approved of. Um, I've learned a lot of other things too, but I won't go into those details right now. So far, I have spent $44,000 of my mother's retirement money for the last seven months in the memory care community. Imagine for a minute instead, if an ADU had been a possibility, instead of running through my mother's retirement money to pay for the memory care community, I could have used some of that money to provide caregivers for her when I was working. And I could have assured that she was getting the care she needs and deserves and I could have made her money last a lot longer. I went to visit my mother on Mother's Day. I found her asleep in another resident's room in that resident's bed in the middle of the afternoon. The, the resident wasn't in the room. When I suggested we go back to her room, she told me she was afraid. She said she was afraid because someone had come into her room at night and frightened her. I called the director on Monday morning. We're on a first name basis. She told me the staff should have prevented my mom from sleeping in the other resident's room, but they did not. She looked at the hall security camera to see it go into my mother's room. And someone did, a female resident who had entered my mother's room uninvited before. I visited my mom again last weekend. When I arrived, I immediately noticed there was no toilet paper in her bathroom. And I know this sounds very small, but remember $6,400 a month. I approached the staff and told them 30 minutes later, when there was still no toilet paper, I texted the director. We need other options for our older adults who need extra care like my mother. An ADU as a possibility could have opened a door into what may have been a viable option, at least for some time. I know there are many others in our community who have stories just like mine or just a little bit different. To really begin to address this problem, we need, as, you know, as several of the speakers have said, we need several more housing options for old, older adults and ADUs could be one component. I really hope to be able to contribute to this important work. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll turn it back to Margaret. You're on mute, Margaret. Thank you, Kim. That is a heart-wrenching story. And I think it just points to the need for options. And as we've been saying all evening, an ADU is an option. It may not be the only one, we know it's not, but it may be, it might've helped Kim, at least as she said for a while, kept the family together and saved some money so she could care for her longer. In looking back over uh, this evening's presenters and you've all been fabulous, thank you. I kind of saw a thread. I saw a thread of history. Um, 
Brent was talking about the, the term carriage house in the 1800s. Well, we know Lexington horses, um, all you have to do is drive around some of our, our inner city areas and you're gonna see carriage houses, um, which were carriage houses. And oftentimes they did move families in. You know, a century ago, it was much more common to have families living on one plot of land or one farm together. They took care of each other. And the three ladies, the age friendly and the home reimagined, there's history there. So Lexington has been, not, we've realized for some time that there is an issue, a growing issue. Lexington is growing in population as Chris shared with us astronomical figures. Thank you, Chris. So we started with Ask Lexington, which some of us on this panel were connected with, and it has just grown from there. The Senior Services Commission got involved. Um, we looked at various options. Housing was a big concern of many people. And as Gail mentioned, Home Reimagine, looking more in depth to the options of alternative housing, has been and is still being looked at. And Mary shared how the pandemic has just illuminated some of the issues that have arisen. I know I've seen some of them in my own family and I know many of you listening probably have too. And thank you to Chris for being so um, thorough in his history of the comprehensive plan, the urban growth, the need for infill and redevelopment if we want to keep our urban boundary and the uniqueness of Lexington and the horse farms. I will share with you briefly that in 1971, I moved to Lexington. And what really struck me was the beauty of the place, the horse farms around it, the rolling hills. It just seemed like a serene community. And I thought, boy, wouldn't this be a great place to live? Well, I wound up living here <laughs> and happy and glad that I am here. But again, we need to look at our options. They're there. We just need to do more research, have more sessions like this. And there will be, remember, on June 10th, another webinar, the ABCs of ADUs 102, June 10th at 6.30. I thank everybody for participating today and sharing. And you can learn more as the slide says here about the June 10th webinar. So remember, you will need to register for this again. So there's the link to register. Thank you everyone.